absolutely ecstatic tonight to introduce our lived it speaker. Um, you know, uh, he's informed me many a times that yes, he has lived it and he is still living it. Uh, Tom Fortin is one of the preeminent entrepreneurial champions in your community, in our community. Um, I was privileged enough to get to meet him uh, shortly after I arrived. And hearing his story kind of anecdotally in bits and pieces, I got to tell you, I was more inspired than ever. Um, he is a, com a community champion. He's an advocate of manufacturing. He's an advocate of entrepreneurship, of innovation. Uh, and what he has accomplished was starting this company, uh, now known as OnTrack, previously had a different name he'll share with you, and the steps that he has gone through to build this company into a globally eminent, recognized company for what it does. Uh, and many of you may, or may have heard of it, some of you may haven't, but I encourage you tonight as ambassadors of NORCAT, this is a story that should motivate you, excite you uh, for all the right reasons. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our, lived it, our first Lived It lecture speaker, uh, Tom Fortin. And Tom, much appreciated on coming tonight. So. Hi, Tom. Good evening. Um, I decided I'm going to tell the on-track story, uh, starting off with a, a PowerPoint presentation. I was just at a trade show about three months ago, and uh, we made up a presentation for the trade show. So I think probably the best way to start is just to go through and look at that presentation to see what is on-track today. It'll give you an idea exactly what the company is about. We've been around for 25 years, uh, and then we're going to start off and start from the beginning. And how did, how did on-track evolve to what it is now? Because it definitely wasn't a straight line. And we're going to look a little bit about uh, marketing on the internet, which is our prime method of marketing, is, is using the internet. So on track today, so we'll just have a quick look at exactly uh, what is on track. Well, on track is a product development company. So we design, certify, and manufacture electronic products. Um, we specialize in serial data acquisition devices, which are basically modules. Um, similar to this, that, to this that just connect to a computer and then allow you to connect real world, world things to the devices. So you can, we could, uh, in industrial applications, we may measure pressure, temperature, flow, something like that, or they can be used in medical applications. We make physiological interfaces that measure heart rate, blood pressure, uh, and, and those sorts of things. Or in this case, this is just a relay interface. It, it, it basically turns things on and then also can measure whether something is turned on or the, or the, or the status of switches and so on. So we have a, a, a couple of uh, uh, analog and digital uh, design labs where we design the circuitry for the, the, the circuits that go in the products. Uh, we design the circuit boards, which are these green things that all the components are uh, uh, soldered to. And we also design and manufacture enclosures, plastic and aluminum enclosures. This is our latest little guy here. We designed this one about a year ago, the, the enclosure, and now we're coming up with a new line of products in these these little boxes. And you'll, you'll see more about what the products do and the types of companies we serve when we get into the body of the, of the presentation. We offer prototyping services to our, our, our uh, customers. So you know, basically, in a lot of cases, our customers come to us with ideas. And it's a matter of us taking the idea and producing a product to satisfy a problem or, or, or whatever, whatever the uh, job requires. But part of that is you know, producing enclosures. We've got to put the electronics in something. So they can be plastic, aluminum, or whatever. And we have machines. There's one here, this is a, these are CNC milling machines, which are the basis of, of how we manufacture the enclosures. We use automated machinery to actually uh, drill holes in the aluminum and plastic enclosures, depending on what the uh, device is going to be used for. And then a big part of the business also is certification. And it's one of the, the toughest parts of designing anything. Uh, it, it, as far as getting functional designs done, not too much of a challenge. It's always a challenge when it comes to certification. Certification involves two components. One is safety, you know, the CSA, the UL, the TUV. So if you're going to sell something that's electrical or electronic, um, it has to be certified, uh, which means it's designed to a standard that it's very unlikely that it's going to electrocute someone, catch on fire, or, or those sorts of things. So there's a safety part of, of, of products if you're getting into manufacturing. And then there's also an EMC part, which is FCC or CE, which you see for Europe. And the, the EMC part involves, you know, this is a chamber we have where we basically put the, the devices in and we, we look at the radio spectrum of frequencies generated by the product to make sure that they're not producing noise in parts of the spectrum that will interfere with telephones or television or anything like that. So um, uh, all the products that we design have to be tested to certain standards so to make sure they're not going to interfere with things. Also, we have to make sure they're not going to be susceptible to 
uh, interference, such as uh, you know, if someone has a cell phone and they're talking on their cell phone generating a lot of RF, we want to make sure our products aren't going to change state or do something they're not supposed to do in the presence of those fields. We also do ESD testing. One of the you know, toughest things with electronic products is electrostatic discharge. And you've probably all seen that. You walk across the carpet, touch the doorknob, zap. Well, that's a very dangerous uh, phenomena for electronic products. And so there's a process we use to make sure the products are robust. We, go, we do diagnostic testing and so on. High pot and ground bond uh, test station. This is a bit like an ad, but it's not an ad. We're not looking for business. This is just our trade show thing here. We have IPC certified technologist, yay. There's Valerie, Valerie's in the crowd here. She's actually the controller of the company now since 2007, uh, working at a test system. So part of manufacturing is quality and test, testing quality. You, you have to design not just the product, but the way it's gonna be manufactured and then the way it's going to be tested. Um, so we have, uh, we have two types of products, stock products or off the shelf products, which these are products that have our names on them, so they actually say on track. Uh, and then we have custom products, which are products that we produce for companies, or actually uh, the products in a lot of cases produce companies, and you'll see a few examples of that. So we have CNC production machines, that's these machines here. You know, we start with uh, enclosures, we'll design an enclosure, they're injection molded in Coburg, Ontario. We're a very big made in Canada company, by the way. Everything is made in Canada. The circuit boards, the enclosures, uh, as, as much of the materials we use in our products that we can get in Canada, we, we, we source them in Canada. Um, so anyway, these, these, these enclosures are put on machines in, in, in uh, 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 groups, and then the holes are drilled depending on whether we're producing or depending on the type of product we're producing. And we have wave soldering. Um, so basically, Here's a panel from a, off of a wave solder machine and it's basically three products that are all the components have been placed on the circuit board and they go through the machine and the machines solder these things so we can make hundreds of these an hour as opposed to, you know, tens or so in a day. So that's on track. You'll get a better idea when we go through the rest of the presentations. I'm going to go through a few of our typical customers to see, you know, where the products are used and so on. So where did all this start? We've been going for 25 years. Here we are. Where did it start? Back in, I don't know when, and I'm the rather unhappy looking fellow on the end in the blue shirt. <laughs> but, uh, you know, basically there's two ways you can get into business. You can go, you can take a business course, learn about business, then learn about buy and sell and margins and do all this kind of stuff. The other way to, to get into business is you can have, uh, have passion for something and, and find out what, you know, if you find out what your passion is, there's a good chance you can make a, make a business out of it if it's the right kind of passion. But, uh, I, I, was, uh, I got my passion early in life basically because we had a large family. My dad worked for Bell Canada. We didn't have a lot of money, you know, not a, a lot of money for toys. I mean, our toys are basically rocks and sand and branches that fell from the trees during windstorms or, you know, that sort of stuff. But my dad worked for Bell Canada at the time where they were basically changing over from uh, 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 mechanical switch gear in the telephone systems to solid state. And so he would, uh, what he decided to do was to bring a whole bunch of this stuff they were getting rid of and brought it home. And I remember coming home from school one day and going down in the basement, because that's where we hung out, and uh, there's this big block of relays and solenoids and switches and things, and I'm like, what's that? And my dad's like, oh, he just hands me a screwdriver and says, I'm go find out. So away I go, I take my screwdriver, I start taking this thing apart, and you know, I didn't know what anything was then. It was a bunch of relays, solenoids and things, and that was my favorite, those are my toys for, for years. And it just developed, uh, uh, you know, because I was curious. So I was finding out about all these things and it ended up being that that was my passion. I mean, everything I got from then on, I took apart. I mean, anything you, even, even today, you know, I bought a new radio the other day, get it home. I didn't turn it on. I took it apart, looked inside to see how the thing worked. But, you know, because I was curious, I was able to find my passion. And that's, you know, curiosity really is the, is, is the road you take to find your passion. So anyway, because of that, uh, I opened up a business in 1985 with a partner. Now, of course, there's a lot of stuff that happened in between there. Uh, I went to college. You know, first of all, it wasn't a straight line to college because I knew I wanted to make electronic things. Uh, after high school, I, I remember walking home from high school, walking down Algonquin Road and seeing a guy in a backhoe, and I walked up and banged on the, back, the, the door of the backhoe. And this was like the day of graduation. So I just got out of high school. I need a job. I should be here at 7 o'clock in the morning. Bring some, you know, get a hard hat, safety boots, and... Boom, for two years I worked in construction. You know, my first couple of weeks, I was separating big rocks from little rocks, which is kind of like what I did when I was a kid. 
So it wasn't so bad, but it still wasn't manufacturing. And then I went into, you know, I drove a truck for a while, I became a small engine mechanic, and finally I was like, okay, you know, I, I love these electronics. I remember when I was a kid, the, you know, the relays, the switches, the things, and I remember making little alarm systems, and I'm, okay, I'm going to Cambrian. So I went to Cambrian and I took the electronics engineering technology program. Graduated in 1984, and Roger here was my lab partner, so we became really good buddies. We met in college, and uh, both of us moved away after college. I went to uh, Montreal to work for a company that installed control systems and paper mills, and Roger went to Ottawa to work for a, a, a computer service company. And uh, Roger wanted, was in Ottawa. He wanted to come back to Sudbury because he, he had his, his girlfriend was here, and he was missing her and stuff. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to Sudbury well because I like fishing. So, <laughs> of course, I ended up being in Fort Francis. There was good fishing there, but there was a lot of good things about Sudbury. And so we both wanted to come back. We talked on the phone and decided we were going to open up a company in, in Sudbury. And the ultimate goal was to manufacture things, though we knew we wouldn't be able to manufacture things right off the bat. So we decided to open up a computer service company. And that's the actual, my dad painted that sign in 1985, and we hung it out, bought, got a little building, and, and we started Digitech Computer Services. And this was a time when computers just came out. You know, in 1985, I mean, no one had computers in their homes. They were basically in hospitals, uh, government, that sort of thing. And, and most of them were sold from companies in Toronto. So our plan was to go to these companies in Toronto and Ottawa, these big computer companies, and say, look, why don't you train us on how your computers work and systems work, and then we'll service all the Northern Ontario ones from Sudbury. Cheaper, faster, better service. And they're like, yeah, okay. So we, we did pretty good. We had, we, we had contracts all over Northern Ontario. So I spent most of the the year on planes, flying to all the little communities, going to the hospitals, the government offices, doing all kinds of, you know, repairs and that sort of thing. But always with the mind that eventually I knew I, I wanted to, to, to make stuff. The first thing we did, uh, Roger and I collaborated on, was this disk drive analyzer. And in those days, computers had floppy drives. You know, some of them were eight inches, and then they were five and a quarter. And the old floppy drives used to go out of alignment, and you used to have to send them away to get them aligned. And the machinery to align them was very expensive. Well, we designed and built our own. And so we had our own drive alignment machine. And so we, got, we even had Cambrian College send us all their computers to be aligned. And you know, we used to tell them, you should get your drives aligned every six months or so. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a, you know, whatever. But uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, there's Google in 1985, by the way. We had a library. There was no internet in 1985, and so designing things was very challenging. You guys, I'm sure most of you realize, but things have changed so much by the internet now. If I want to find out what chips are available for certain applications, you just Google, boom, 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 away you go. Uh, then we had a library. We used to have to write to companies and say, put us on your list, mailing list. And you know, the best design companies had the best postal service in those days, because you'd get the, ch the stuff in about the chips and you know, say, oh, Eureka, now I can build this or that or whatever. But so we had a library. Uh, but it didn't last too long. In 1986, Roger leaves to go work at Computerland. Why? Because he was getting married. Uh, what are you going to do? So, you know, we weren't making that much money. We just started the business. We had to buy equipment. You know, we weren't making a, a lot of dough. So Roger went to Computerland because he was getting married. I took a teaching job at Cambrian and then took all of the stuff from OnTrack. I bought a house and moved on, uh, on track into the basement. I basically changed the name from Digitech to OnTrack. And why did I do that? Well, Digitech, I just saw so many Digitechs around in magazines and things like that. And little did I realize there's probably 10,000 on tracks in the world, but I'm not changing it again. 1987, while I was teaching, I designed uh, the first commercial product, and I actually had one here. Valerie found one in the shop today. We cleaned it up. That was the first thing in 1987. And this was a, 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 it's a computer interface. It connects to a computer via serial port. It has some digital I.O., some analog I.O and uh, a processor, memory, and, and a bunch of other stuff on here. And we put these, uh, uh, and now 1987, keep in mind, there's no internet. So how do you tell people about your product in 1987? Well, magazines, magazine ads are very expensive. Uh, in those days, they had you where they wanted you because you know, ads this big in EDN were $6,000 in those days, which is, you know, you think how many of these you gotta sell to pay for that? Well, an awful pile. So we, we did the, the cheap route, we did, uh, uh, or I, uh, the company, we did press releases. We send press releases to the magazine and pray and hope that they would actually publish it and we get a free little ad for our device. We did direct mailings uh, and, and, and ultimately we ended up selling about 150 of these. We thought, well, that's pretty cool. There's the first ad in 1989. I actually brought the magazine in here. 
our first ad in electronics today, 1989. Eh? Yeah, I should have a bronze, yeah. Um, then 1993, now, and this is how a lot of products came about. This was the first product that really took off, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but basically, it was designed around a chip. Microchip had sent us the things, showing, uh, explaining about this new chip they're coming out with, the PIC 16 c 71 It was the first microcontroller that had analog and digital on the same chip. So unlike, uh, 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 you know, this product here, this product here with all these parts were basically all crammed into one chip. And so I was like, holy cow, you know, I can buy this chip for five bucks and it does everything that all these do. You know, so we made this product, sold it for 99 bucks. Uh, it cost about, you know, $22 to make and so on. And uh, we ended up selling a lot of them. We sold uh, over 20,000 of them to date now. And basically, you know, they didn't sell too much in 93, 94, and then all of a sudden, boom, the internet came. So in 1995, we put up a, a web page, and it was one of the first ones in Sudbury. I think we were number four or five on Vianet, the old Vianet. And that, that was our URL at the bottom there, icewall.vianet.com or .on.ca.com forward slash ontrack.htm. If people call, what's your web address? They didn't say what your web address was. We'd say, you want our web address? They're like, what's that? You know? But what it did was, when the web, when the web first came out in 95, the, the web was used mainly by universities and military. And so that's who primarily became our customers. A lot of military customers, a lot of universities and schools, which is perfect, because that was the kind of the thing we were, we were targeting with this. And the, pages, the web page has evolved. It's gone through five or six different revisions. That's it in 1998. And uh, just to show you, you know, today, there's our web traffic, and I just took that last night. It just shows how many people come to our website every day. And, uh, um, and let's get over here so I can show the numbers. You know, this is 150 here, this is 300. So we, we get at least, you know, 100. We, you know, during the week, we get 200 a day, and uh, weekends, 100 or so. But we always have at least 100 unique visitors a day to the website. And these are people who get there because they're searching for what we sell. And, you know, how do we get to, and, and 100 a day is pretty good when you're in an obscure market. Uh, it's certainly enough to keep us busy. Um, so how do you get this? And that's, I've already offered to Don to do another lecture on internet marketing because there's a, there's a whole, uh, we do a, a few tricks to get up in the search engines. If you search for USB data acquisition, we're on the page. We're, we're near number one. Uh, you can try it later. Um, and, and basically it's because of the way we set up the web page, because of all the extra information, the back doors and all that. But that's a whole other lecture. So we'll leave it for a month or so, whenever we're gonna do that one. But anyway, by 1999, we had nine products in production. Now, keep in mind, I'm in my basement. I have three people coming to my house in, in the West End. You know, I, and I, Valerie knows I sleep in a lot. What are you gonna do? So, I'd be in bed and I hear the door open, they go downstairs, start working and stuff. And, and so I had three workstations down there, so they'd be soldering boards every day. Uh, uh, and things were just moving along great. And then in 1999 is when things really went on, caught on fire. Uh, for a few years, there was, a, there was a lot of companies looking at our products and thought they were kind of cool. Because at the time, they were like the, the ADU, ADR, AD, sorry, ADR 101. I didn't even bring one. Oh, well. But the, uh, it, it was a pretty cool product. Uh, but anyway, in 1999, we had a major POS manufacturer, which is point of sale. So this was our first big contract. We got a contract to design and manufacture the, the controls that are used in self-checkout systems. You know, when you go to Home Depot, you scan your own stuff. Those, the electronics in those are actually made in Sudbury. We've made over 80,000 of those things. And so it's a... Uh, it was, a, it, it, was, it was quite a thing in, in 1999 because we, we, we were working for a few years on the design and finally they're going to go into production. And the design, our, our levels of design competency, competency had to increase substantially because well, they were demanding CSA, UL, TUV certification. TUV, we had to, you know, TUV, they come from Germany to inspect your plant to make sure that, you know, you're up to standard as far as safety and quality goes. It was an expensive uh, 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 um, uh, proposition. We had to do EMC testing, CE testing, and we couldn't do it ourselves. We had to hire CSA, and every product you send to CSA, and there was a bunch of them for this, these systems, it was 15,000 bucks just to have the thing tested. And I remember I was on the, on the, on the phone with one of the engineers, and um, uh, you know, we're going over a design review, and at the end of the conversation, Bob, this guy in Atlanta says, Tom, can you, uh, you got some MTBF numbers for these things? Uh, can you get those to me? So, oh, yeah, sure, Bob, I'll, I'll give them to you tomorrow. 
click, I hang up the phone, I walk over to the computer, to the search engine of the day. What the hell is MTBF? <laughs> you know, it was a, there were so many things that, that, that you had to do to produce a product above and beyond functionality. And so anyway, I figured out MTBFs and away we go. Factory inspection. So here I am in my basement. Finally, they're going to go into production with this thing. They call me up and say, Tom, we're going to come and inspect your factory. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I did what any reasonable person would do. I renovated the basement. <laughs> Put up some walls, painted. But you know, it didn't take long. We, we moved in. We opened the product development center. And so we knew we were getting into some serious numbers. I mean, in the basement, we were making you know, uh, a person can make 40 ADR, ADR, ADR 101s or 20 ADR 2000s. Uh, but, you know, we can make, you know, 50, 60, 100, 100 a day in the basement. So we opened up uh, the product development center in Sudbury. We have uh, two wave solder machines. We've got nine of these machines for cutting the enclosures. We increased our production to hundreds a day of uh, interfaces. And by then we had about 15 or 20 products uh, uh, running in, in, in 2000. And here's, here's a typical uh, custom company. This one was, uh, uh, is Limestone Technologies. This, these were two uh, professors at Queen's University who came to me. They worked in, in the psychology department and they were doing the study of palometrics, which is the study of sex offender uh, uh, behavior. And they were using polygraphs. They came to me and said, Tom, you know, polygraphs suck. Can you, can you make us a polygraph? And so I said, you know, I said well, what, what do you mean? What do you, what, what do you want? What is a polygraph? What do you, what do you want to measure? told me what they wanted to measure and ended up designing a polygraph for them. And it's gone through three revisions. Uh, they now have both quit their, their job teaching, run the, running the company. They just bought another one and a half million dollar building beside the other one. And they're the second largest uh, manufacturer of these in, in the world. Uh, they sell them uh, all over the place. Most of the reality shows where you see them with polygraphs, most of them were made in Sudbury. Uh, Woohoo! Sudbury! But, but, you know, and we just finished this year a, uh, the new 24-bit Paragon uh, uh, physiological acquisition system. And it's not just a polygraph. This is a medically certified device that can be used for general physiological measurement. It measures blood rate, blood pressure, O2, heart rate, respiration, uh, a, whole bunch of, a whole bunch of stuff. And that's what I love about these guys is they're taking this technology and applying it now to, you know, other industries, medical industries, and expanding the business not just doing the, the polygraphs, which is kind of a, a, a limited market, though they do sell thousands of these things. Um, and that's what we do is, you know, we've created about 24 companies from OnTrack. You'll see another one in a, in, a, in a little bit, just by creating the product that enables the company to, be, uh, to run. 2002, we added a CE compliance test facility to the, 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 the center, and, and this was, uh, you know, every product we design, we've got to do CE testing. If we send it to CSA, it's 15 grand. We set up the center, it was 250K, but you know, it doesn't take long to pay for itself when you're sending stuff away to CSA. Plus it gave us a huge advantage. We could do CE testing on the fly. You know, design, get the circuit board, test it, and, and, and uh, see if you're in the clear before you go on to the next step. 2003, we introduced a whole line of new stock, stock products and we stepped up from the ADRs. They were fully enclosed, our blue box product, which has been selling for 10 years now, and these have all the full certifications. Uh, all certified in our, in our factories, all made with these kinds of machines and the wave solder machines and they're sold well, all over the place. Then 2006, it was a great year, we shipped our 200,000th interface. So we've been pumping these things up. Even the, the, the point of sale ones, you know, we were making 500 a week of different models. It was, it was uh, uh, a really fun time. Uh, then what happened in 2006 was our main POS customer in the States decided to move production to China. So they basically said to us, the next design you do for us is going to be designed for production in Asia. And I said, oh, wait a minute, we're not that kind of company. You know, I, I'm about making things in Canada. We only design products that we are going to manufacture. You're going to manufacture in Canada or we're going to manufacture in Canada. So we lost half the business. Not such a big deal, but it only got worse from there. You remember the financial crisis in 2008? What happened in the financial crisis, um, companies lost confidence in you know, you no longer had Home Depot building 200 stores a year and Walmart building 500 stores a year and thousands of factories being built every month in China. It, it, they're still going on, but it, it basically slowed down. Home Depot is actually cutting uh, stores now. So our shipments sank to about 5,000 units a year, which is, no, it's okay. But at that time, I decided to change the focus from industrial products, control stuff, to medical. And so we started designing more custom medical things, x-ray controllers for a lot of 
uh, companies in the States, uh, uh, laser controllers and physiological stuff, a lot of little gizmos and gadgets and stuff. One of them, this is a cool one, this is one of the latest ones. In 2011, I, I met two fellows in the basement of the University of Toronto Physics Labs, and they were physics masters, and they had come up with a new way to use lasers for, uh, in medical surgery. And these were lasers that instead of using heat, and most lasers cut with heat, you know, just high energy light that burns material away. They came uh, looking at it a different way of using the light at a certain frequency and wavelength that used cold ablation. So instead of actually burning stuff away, it would vibrate or ablate material away. And what it meant was you didn't damage adjacent cells. So this is a, this is a really cool company. Um, uh, basically, if you do medical surgery, ophthalmology, uh, internal or cosmetic, whatever, the healing time is cut down to almost nothing because you're left with open collagen fibers, so everything just heals right away after you cut with the laser. I've, I've cut my finger with this and stuff, and it's, it's pretty cool. So anyway, so these guys, they're in the basement of the lab. You know, this is three years ago. I, I don't know, if it might have been 2010, but anyway. They got all the optics all figured out. Uh, uh, the thing is, is to, to make this thing work, uh, uh, in industrial applications also, they needed a control that was a pretty special thing they wanted. And when they first told me what they wanted to do, the first thing I said, I was, I, you can't do that. It's not possible. And after about a month later, I got back to them and said, yeah, maybe I'll give this a shot. And it ended, ended up, uh, after two years and about 20 different revisions, we ended up with the actual control for these laser systems. And now we have a company. It's called Adodyne Lasers, and they're manufacturing, they're selling them uh, all over the world. They've gone to uh, Korea, China, Japan. Uh, I was there last week. They're making three for an ophthalmology company in Germany. Um, but these things cut, you know, Gorilla Glass. And you can see the, the non-heat part of it. You see there's a match. You put some marks on a match with the laser so that uh, it shows that it cuts without using abl uses ablation, not heat, to actually remove material. But Right now, they're selling the lasers mainly in industrial applications because you don't have to go through the certification process. The medical certification through FDA is a long process. But that's the kind of thing that you know, OnTrack does is we, people come to us with problems or ideas and we produce the products and, uh, um, and help, help or enable companies to be produced. We don't produce the companies, they do that. But, uh. And so here we are in 2013, we've got the ADU 70 series almost ready to ship. Don't worry, Valerie, I'll get to it. I've been dragging my feet on these a bit because all, all that's left is to do some final testing and write manuals and things. And, I don't know, I like going to camp. So, uh, and we've got a few more custom products in the work. We're into getting into some wearable technology things. And, and so where are we going to be in 2016? Well, who knows? I mean, that's one thing I, you know, through the whole 25 years with the business is, you know, every time you look back two or three years, you, you think, geez, I never thought I'd be here, you know, or, or doing this or that, you know. It's always the same kind of thing. We're always going to be making stuff, but, uh, uh, the path has never been a straight line. A few little bumps, there's a lot more to the story than this, but I have a strict time limit. Don told me he's very strict about his time, and I want to leave a good 15, 20 minutes for you, you people to ask questions and so on, and if we can talk about whatever you like. So in conclusion, OnTrack was created simply because my dad, when I was a kid, my dad gave me a screwdriver. So we have a, oh, by the way, since I have my own company, we have our own screwdriver. So. Everyone gets a screwdriver before you go, in case you haven't found your passion yet. And we're also, uh, uh, we brought along a big machine here, and uh, we don't want to bring it back. So we're going to, we're donating this machine to Norcat for their, Don doesn't even know about this yet, for their product discovery lab, which is going to be a 2,000 square foot facility. You know, you're coming here to learn about entrepreneurship. So you're learning about, you sweating now, Don? No, this is great. Okay. The, you're coming here to learn about business. So they tell you about all the rules, you know, you gotta do business plans and yeah. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a big rule guy. I'm more about, you know, let's, let's do it, let's just build this. And even the laser guys, are, you know, when we're, we're talking about, you know, how to sell the products and how to market them, you know, they're thinking, they're, they're, they're asking me, what are the rules? You know, I said, well, you know, you're, you're innovating, you're making the most innovative lasers in the world. You know, your, 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 your business plan, you don't have to have a business plan. You can do whatever you want. I mean, there's no set formula for how you're going to sell the lasers or commissions or all these sorts of things. Do whatever the hell you want. You can innovate your, the way your business is going to grow just as much, you know, use as much innovation there as you do use in the products themselves. But anyway, this product discovery lab, Ed and I just named it outside today, just by the way. The, 
what, what, what I want to help NORCAT do is build a lab so they have equipment, so people when they come in with ideas and they want to play around and, and hopefully we'll have some people in there that'll help out. We'll have some, a CNC machine that cut plastic and aluminum so you can build prototypes, you know, maybe some 3D printers and uh, some electronic stuff. And so we're going to help out uh, NORCAT with a bit of cash and, uh, and some machinery to uh, get that going. Biggest lessons learned. Hmm. I don't know. Just well, I don't know. Just that they, they're really uh, there are no rules as far as, uh, as starting a business, and you know they'll, they'll, you're going to come here and you know they'll talk about business plans. That do you talk about business plans and those sorts of things? You know, and and, and nothing ever turned out. I, every, everything I planned, it just didn't work out the way I planned, but it turned out good. You know, but it, it basically, you know, the biggest lesson I learned, I don't know. That's a hard one to answer. Yeah. yeah. Anyone got another question? <laughs> no, I, I taught there from uh, 86 to 98. And uh, I love teaching. It was an awesome job. Uh, uh, but I just got too busy with the business to, to keep teaching. Uh, actually, uh, as crazy as it sounds, I would go back to teach if they opened up the technology programs. The problem is, is Cambrian is, Cambrian used to be Cambrian College of Applied Arts and Technology. Now it's Cambrian College. So where's the technology? Well, they closed most of the technology programs. So they're not producing people like me, you know, the, the, the technologists, the people, you know, they're basically... That's point, actually. We need a place where, like this, there's cultivation of, of young people who say, uh, what can I do? How can I do yeah. it? Where can I go? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I'm hope we're going to start lobbying. Hopefully, we're going to get technology programs back and running. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see the electronics program back up and running because electronics isn't, isn't, a, it isn't a, 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 an entity on its own. Electronics is the enabler of all other industries. You know, if you want to have a mining technology group, you've got to have electronics. You want to have, you know, medical, you've got to have electronics. I mean, you can't just buy iPhones and iPads and think you're going to make all these companies out of this kind of stuff. You've got to be able to make your own stuff. And so we're, we're, we, Sudbury's really suffered because we've lost the technology program. We're not producing technologists. There are a lot of local companies that are started by technologists from, from Cambrian. A lot of the companies that make stuff here were started by them. And so hopefully we're going to get a push going to get some of those programs going again. And that's part of this lab here is to have a place where young people can come. And that's the time to find your passion or when you're old or whatever. But you know, we, we need a venue so people can see stuff. You know, like my dad gave me the screwdriver, you know, and I, you know, that, that's what got things going, and, and so we got to give screwdrivers to people, so. No idea. <laughs> no, just more, like, honestly, once you get going into business, the, probably the thing that's most important to us now is quality of life. You know, when you're young and, you know, you want to buy stock cars, houses, and all this stuff, you know, you want money. And then as you get older, you know, you start thinking, well, now I want to have fun and do stuff. And, and with the business now, we're in the place where, you know, we're making money we're, and we're, we're having fun and, and it's about quality of life. And so I hope that, you know, by 2016, we all, me and the employees have a better quality of life and, and the business, well, it'll, it'll be going. And I don't know the terminology about business plans and all this stuff. I learned the terminology we do is bootstrapping. Hey, Don? I heard it from Don. <laughs> We're a bootstrap company. So basically, the company grew through revenue. I've never really borrowed money and, and, and have no interest in, in, in that sort of thing. And, you know, when we, when we were running uh, Digitech, I mean, I lived at home with my parents. I ate craft dinner. You know, it was, it was, it was uh, you know, you just got to... Uh, if you're, it makes such a difference in your life if you can put off buying a car or buying a house five years, you know, so you don't have to have payments, you know, so many, and it's hard to tell, you know, young people, you know, don't go do this, don't go do that, save your money, blah, 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 they just tell you to go jump in the lake or whatever, but it's, it's so important to be modest in your expectations about not just what you want, but when you're going to get it. It makes a big difference if you're going to end up, you know, whether you want to be a free man or a debtor down the road and, and too many of us end up in too much debt from being too much in a hurry. We, we, uh, um, we have a few patents, but 
never been a big patent guy because they're only good if you want to spend money on lawyers and I'm not a fan of that. No offense to any lawyers in the crowd. But, but the, the, how do we protect it? Basically, we just don't give the code, you know. So, so when we design something, you know, like these, these are the, one of the modules used inside the, the uh, self-checkout systems. We, we never gave away the code, but it doesn't matter really. Like everything we make is innovative in its function, but it's easily copied and, you know, I'm not going to chase after anyone if they copied anything. We'd had, we actually had a company copy one of our products and, oh, I can't see the name of the company, damn, because it's, it's a really cool name. But anyway, but the, 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 uh, 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 I just don't worry about it. My, my philosophy is design it, you know, make sure it works, it's certified, sell it. And then if someone copies it down the road, whatever. You know, I, I mean, too many companies delay talking and selling things because they're worried about patents and blah, blah. How many, how many, you know, how many times people come in the office or, or they want to talk to you about their great idea and you've got to sign all these papers and all this stuff? It's like, ah. Um, it, you know, in certain cases, sure, it's valid, but in most cases, just make it, you know. We really don't have any, I've never written an NDA form, a non-disclosure agreement, and never asked anyone, to, I've never asked anyone ever to sign one of those. We've signed tons ourselves, you know, from you know, these guys and everybody else pretty much. You know, I didn't have insurance. You know, and yeah, so we, we were taking a risk. We were probably breaking city bylaws and, you know, soldering equipment and confined spaces and, oh my God. We actually did have a fire in 2000, but it was an arsonist, thank God. So, <laughs> we actually, did, some guy piled up garbage. It was, I don't know if you remember the West End arsonist. He lit about eight houses on fire. Mine was number one. <laughs> uh, so, I knew it was time to get on track out of there. So, but yeah, I never, now, of course, we have product liability. So, and, and it's another part of the, the, the regulations. You not only have the certifications you're required for safety and EMC, you, you know, if a company's going to buy a million bucks for this stuff from you, they want to make sure you have product liability insurance. We always have to send them forms saying, yeah, we have X number of dollars in insurance. So, and the insurance is, is expensive. It actually jumped up quite a bit this year. The company we've had, we, insurance company we've had for the last 10 years actually declined to cover us this year because they're getting out of the business for some reason. So we had to go to another one and so up went the rates for somebody. But yeah, as far as a succession plan, you know, I have my eyes open for another engineer to take over or a technologist, whatever. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be family or friends and, and we have a lot of, you know, pretty well all of my buddy's kids work, like Roger, his son works for us and all my friends, the kids all work at OnTrack, everyone works at OnTrack. You know. People ask me how many people work at OnTrack, I say, meh, about half, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the other half are family and friends. <laughs> but, but yeah, no real big succession plan yet, so, but I'm not worried about it. Yeah, the, uh, that, that thing was when, when uh, before the internet, selling your products was tough. You had two avenues. You could do magazines or you could go to distributors. And uh, that was it, you know, or direct mail. But direct mail, pff, anyway. Uh, so we, 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 had, we ended up getting a distributor in, in Canada, Electrosonic in Toronto, and another one in Phoenix. Uh, in, in the States. And the thing about distributors is distributors take generally in, in our business 30% as uh, uh, and, and the thing about distributors, I really didn't like having distributors because it was a pretty big cut. You know, they made almost as much money as us. The other thing about it, as soon as you give a distributor to territory, they not only get the 30% the from the guys they get, they get 30% because everyone who calls you from their, ter their territory, you have to refer them. And so your marketing efforts are, you know, producing more uh, customers for them. And so it's, uh, we only sell direct now. We have no distribution anymore. And with the internet and with the way shipping is now, and our stuff is all, it's pretty high value stuff. It's always, it's about 200 bucks a pound for shipping. And so 200 bucks a pound value when we ship it. And so it's, you know, if you gotta pay 10 bucks to ship it somewhere, who cares? So we could be in Tuk Tuk or whatever and, and uh, uh, we'd be fine. And, I like to be in Sudbury because I think Sudbury is a great place. I love the outdoors and I'm, I'm never leaving. And uh, the only way to do this kind of thing in Sudbury was to create a company and so here we are. I don't know, I, don't, I can't think of any regrets. Like, you know, I, I made mistakes but I learned from them all, you know. There was, 
you know, about the companies you, I learned the hard way that the, the most important thing about people starting a business isn't the idea, it's the person. You know, we had, uh, I had a few companies I started with early that ended up doing all this effort and I even invested money and then I do that with some of them uh, and they end up going bankrupt and it wasn't because it wasn't a great idea, it was because the person, not they were a bad person, they just weren't, you know, savvy enough or business minded enough to actually pull the thing off and so they did a, a lot of uh, crazy mistakes. And so now when it comes to, you know, who are we going to partner to and we generally have a choice because we're, we're solicited for people to do work for, for, for people, with people asking us to design stuff for them, we turn most of them down. I just cherry pick and that's how I'm able to steer the company into, you know, if I want to go in this sector or this sector, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, or, you know, I think it's a lot easier for someone who's passionate about a product or a process to learn business than for a business person to get passionate about a product or process. Like, I think it's the better, you know, I had to learn business along the way. I just made up the rules that I, you know, you wouldn't believe how we set pricing. Like, Valerie, just yesterday, she's like, I got this order for X number of this and that, and she says, what do you think is a good unit cost? I said, write down a number, I'll write down a number. So I write down a number, she wrote down a number, we were close, eh, that's it. You know, we just make up the rules. And it, the, the, it, you know, there, there, you know, there are the predefined uh, rules, well, not predefined, but there's general uh, levels of profitability you need in this industry. When you're making off the shelf stuff, it's generally five times parts. And how do I know that? I was at a trade show and I eavesdropped on a bunch of big shots and stuff. <laughs> you know? And if you're building custom stuff, you know, you know for, a, for a company where you're going to put their name on it and they're going to buy lots of them and you don't have to do any of the marketing and all that kind of stuff, it's three times parts. And so we're always, you know, we can just, you know, we've been doing it long enough now that we just wing it, you know, and, and you know, we make enough money to buy beer and worms and stuff. Our motto is innovation through simplicity. And so, uh, now, what do you think, what's that have to do with software? Well. We never did really complicated stuff, as crazy as that might sound. All of our products are fairly simple, innovative things, uh, but we never built the software. We never, we, you know, we're now we're getting into wireless, which I'm nervous about. I like wireless, it's cool and everything, but it's another thing to go wrong as far as with a product and so on. We kept our products simple, and you know, with our USB devices, we provide drivers so that you can use it with any software package you want. But we don't, we don't sell any software, or, or we give a little, few little basic test programs and so on. But you're right, software is, software is too much of a moving target to try and you know, stab it as far as the product goes. And so we make our products so they're generic. You can use this with Windows, Mac, uh, Linux, um, whatever. And I'm very reluctant to make any thing that's dependent upon uh, one particular, you know, version of software. Anyway, I just stay away from that kind of stuff. No, I mean, uh, when, when, someone, when, when someone wants us to design something for them, say it's this, this box here, there's a circuit board in here, there's a case. What does it cost us to make this? Well, a circuit board spin, you know, if you do it quickly, it's 500 bucks. The parts might cost you 500 bucks. Uh, and a mold to make this case is about 15,000. So you generally wouldn't do that off the, uh, off the bat. We'd take an off the shelf thing. That's what we did with this one. This one you're started in an off the shelf enclosure. And then we, when they were starting selling enough of them that they were gonna, now they have limestone right on the plastic. And you know, this is another step up. It's a uh, polystyrene, not, what the heck is this stuff? I forget. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, so basically there, there are fixed costs that I know what they are. And so we usually just, you know, what does it cost to design a product? Honestly, about well, two grand. So what do we charge? 3,500. You know? And we don't try to make money on prototypes. And, but we don't do prototypes unless the character of the people is the proper, you know, is there, that we have a high probability that it's actually gonna go to production. I, uh, there's a lot of companies out there, like Adderdyne, before they came to us, they went to another company and they charged them 80 grand to, to design something that didn't work. And, you know, we charge them for this. Nothing. You know, this is, I have a foundation now, and so we pick a company every couple of years and do it for free. And so the conditions are that uh, they have to stay Canadian, they can't sell a company to a foreign corporation, they buy a Canadian when they can, blah, blah, blah.